The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. The subject of the story you're about to hear is murder. But the subject is also time. We've all heard of killing time. But have you heard about using time to kill? You will in the next few minutes when Mr. Owen Layton himself tells you his most ingenious scheme for getting rich quick by means of sudden death. Owen, for heaven's sake, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be in Paris. I thought I'd surprise you, Harriet, and I seem to have done exactly that. By the way, I met your charming dance instructor coming out of the house, uh, although I'm quite sure he didn't see me. But I don't understand... How could you possibly have returned home so soon? I was in a terrible hurry to see you, darling. I simply couldn't wait to see you and do this. Our mystery drama, Sea of Troubles, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser. And stars Stotts Cotsworth. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Our spine tingler begins across the sea in the delightful city of Paris. They say that you can sit at a sidewalk cafe in one of these streets and sooner or later meet everyone you've ever known. Well, now we're going to introduce you to someone who you don't know, but whose acquaintance you'll enjoy making. His name is Owen Layton, and he prefers to tell you his unusual story in his own words. I arrived in Paris at 10 o'clock that morning. But I didn't leave my hotel room until well after four. I knew my brother Gerald's habits only too well. He'd probably be sleeping until noon. But I knew where he would be at 4 p.m., of course. At Patrick's Cafe on the Rue de Montparnasse. Everyone loved Gerald at Patrick's because he was famous for always paying his bills. Uh, with my money, of course. Bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour. I chose a table well to the side, but my appearance still attracted considerable attention. And why not? With my rumpled English tweeds, a long gray beard, and the style of Ulysses S. Grant, a pair of crutches to keep my monstrously bandaged foot off the Parisian asphalt, well, I must have been quite a sight. Garçon, a pair no, s'il vous plaît. Ah, uh, très bien, monsieur. Well, what do you know, Owen, for the love of Pete? <laughs> Hello, Gerald. <laughs> I'm glad you were able to recognize me under all this hair and bandages. Well, <laughs> how are you? What's the matter with your foot? Oh, never mind about that. <laughs> Give me a look at you. I haven't seen my kid brother in over a year. You know something? You look more French than ever. Ah, yeah, come on now. Let's hear about that foot, Owen. Uh, <laughs> and the beard. When did you grow all that shrubbery, huh? Well, I got the idea from you. The last time I was in Paris. This thing? Yeah. Ah, this is nothing compared to you. Now, listen, the last time I saw a beard like that, it was on a $50 bill. <laughs> yes. I guess it got a little out of hand. I'm thinking of trimming it, as a matter of fact. More like your style. Well, I'll introduce you to my barber. Hey, do me a favor, hmm? Gerald. Finish this perno for me. I shouldn't be drinking with my foot. Well, what's your foot got to do with it? It's, it's the gout. You remember, I wrote you about it a few months ago. I had an attack just before I sailed for Europe. Well, how's your painting coming along? You sold anything yet? Eh, The only thing I sold is my watch, uh, as if you didn't know. Mm, (laughs) Yes, I know. You came to Paris to starve in a garret. But you look pretty well fed to me. 
Uh, oh, uh, speaking of that, <laughs> how was Harriet, huh? Well, speaking of which, uh, the money I sent you or being well fed? Oh, God, you know what I mean. Oh, uh, now, how is she? Still the same? No. She's more of the same. She's richer than ever. Uh, she's fatter than ever. She's also meaner than ever. Well, she couldn't be too mean. I mean, not if she lets you grow that beard. <laughs> I still don't see why you wanted to grow it. You always made such fun of mine. Well, I had my reason, Gerald. It was part of my plan. Plan? Uh, what plan? Why, to kill my mean, fat wife. Of course. So, this is your garret, is it? Pretty luxurious for a starving artist, isn't it? Uh, it's not bad. Yeah, and all those canvases. Some even have paint on them. Well, don't tell me you're really working. Uh, oh, and... Now, uh, I know you're no saint, but I don't think you're wicked enough to do what you said. Strangle Harriet? Uh-uh. No, Gerald, I'm wicked enough, just not foolish enough. My wife's money will be precious little good to me in prison. Uh, now, now, don't tell me you've got some kind of a, a foolproof scheme, Owen, because there is no such thing. Sit down. And no matter how clever you are, there's always someone cleverer. In the detective novels, perhaps. Now, sit down before I kick you with my gouty foot. I've got five pounds of bandage there. It makes quite a weapon. I, I, I don't understand what you meant uh, about, uh, about gout. It's the very cornerstone of my plan. I have established a medical history of the disease, if questions arise later. Questions? Yes, about the bandages. Owen, I have never seen you like this. You're really talking wildly. Now, those crutches, the beard, all this crazy talk about killing people. What? It's not crazy at all. It's a beautiful, rational scheme. And one that you will be eager to see succeed. <sighs> Owen, what's happened between you and Harriet? Huh? Well, nothing sudden. It's been a gradual change. Perhaps the inevitable result of advancing years. You know, I was considerably younger than Harriet when we married. Now it seems I'm not young enough. Now, wait a minute. Are you cutting me off? Are you going to stop sending me money? Nothing of the kind. As long as my income can support it, you can continue to develop your artistic talents. The question is, how long will my income continue? It's been ten years since I married Harriet. The difference between our ages is suddenly not so great. Harriet is discovering that there are younger men in the world. In fact, there's one particular one she's fond of. You're joking. Uh, he's a dancing instructor, as a matter of fact. Uh, she met him when I had my first attack of gout. I couldn't move for a month while Harriet indulged herself in non-domestic pleasures like dancing. What to talk about? Killing her? Killing her carefully, Gerald. With due regard to the risks involved. Actually, I thought of the answer when I was flat on my back. I had plenty of time to think then. About what? A unique phenomenon of the modern age. The magnificent paradox of transoceanic travel. Travel? Yes. A ship makes its journey in some five days. A jet plane takes only a few hours. But you hate planes. You've never been on a plane in your life. Yes, that's right. They terrify me. But what does all this have to do with killing Harriet? Everything. For you and I, brother, are going to put that transatlantic paradox to use. We're going to prove that the difference between a ship and a plane is a lovely way to commit murder. It was almost two weeks later that Gerald and I stood on the dock at La Havre and looked at the trim lines of the SS Empress. She wasn't exactly the largest vessel lying at anchor, but on that particular Saturday, she was certainly the busiest. That was fine with me. The more excitement on the pier, the less noticeable Gerald and I were as we made our way toward A deck. Our progress was slow, since I never really managed to use those crutches. Finally, we made our way to stateroom G, and as the door finally shut behind us... I collapsed on the bunk. I looked at my younger brother's face and felt considerably better. <laughs> Poor Gerald. His complexion was so pale white against his reddish beard. 
now fuller by two barbarous weeks. <laughs> Relax, Gerald. Everything's got to be all right. Well, I wish I had your confidence, Owen. Now, well, let's take care of the passports first, and then we can call the steward. All right. Here, here, here they are. Ah, good. Now, we have to do this very carefully. With infinite patience, I set about the delicate task of removing the small photographs from both passports. I was as precise as a jeweler. Then I squeezed glue from a tiny tube and replaced them. One bearded face substituted for the other one. Yes, my brother and I look quite a bit alike. Despite the six-year difference in our age... Owen, are you sure nobody will notice? Now, you're not supposed to tamper with these passports. Yes, that's true. And I understand it's also a crime to kill someone. Nevertheless, that's exactly what I plan to do. Now, let's ring for the steward. Uh, all right. The man who answered our ring was a perfect delight. An aging cockney with a thin crest of white hair. The mouth of a pixie and the squinty eyes of a myopic. The latter, of course, was going to be a blessing. Oh, everything all right, Mr. Layton? Yes, everything's just fine. Your name Mr. Porkins? Uh, yes, sir, that's me. Sir Porkins, at your service. Well, Mr. Porkins, I'm afraid I'm going to be something of a burden to you on this voyage. As you see, I'm an invalid. Oh, uh, yes, sir, your, your poor foot, sir. Exactly, my poor foot. As a result, I'm going to be forced to take all my meals in here. So you'll have to arrange matters with the dining steward. I trust that can be arranged. Oh, yes, sir. Don't you worry none about that, sir. Ah, good. Nor will I be spending any time on deck. The least bit of roll is extremely painful for me. So I'll remain in my stateroom until we reach port. Ah, uh, what a pity, sir. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. I've got a great deal of business to take care of between here and New York. I'll have enough paperwork to keep me busy. So if you'll just bring me my meals and keep me from being disturbed, you'll be doing your job handsomely. All right? Understood? Oh, yes. Understood, Mr. Layton. Uh, <laughs> see you later then, Mr. Porkins. Oh, yes, sir. <sighs> oh, we were lucky. <laughs> he seems like a cooperative old geezer. Yes, but be careful. Always keep your door locked so he can never enter without knocking. And every time he... Brings you that tray. Make sure that you're either dozing or buried in papers. Understand? Understood. Yeah. Well, when I think about what you're going to do in New York while I'm on board the ship, I ask. Oh, what I'm going to do in New York is going to be a pleasure. But you're so cold-blooded about it, Owen. You are going to kill a human being. No, I never said that. I said I was going to kill Harriet. <laughs> she is in her lavish New York townhouse, thinking about nothing but her dancing lessons. While aboard the SS Empress, two men are plotting her demise. Of course, we're not yet certain how Owen Layton plans to get away with murder. Even if he does fly to New York and his brother sails in his place, we'll simply have to wait until I continue shortly with Act Two. Let's return to Stateroom G on A deck of the SS Empress. It's almost sailing time. The first all visitors ashore warning has been sounded on all levels of the great ship. But in Stateroom G, of course, the warning has a special significance because now the visitor has become the passenger. And the passenger has become the visitor. But let Mr. Owen Layton speak for himself. Uh, listen to me, Gerald. And listen very carefully. Uh, for Pete's sake, Owen, we've been over this a hundred times. But now I'm saying it for the last time. You must do exactly what I've said. Exactly. The smallest variation can cause total disaster. Oh, I promise you. 
I won't move from the stateroom. I'll be a good little rabbit in my cage. Yes, it's exactly what worries me. Your rabbit-like tendencies. Uh, don't expect me to enjoy it. I think of all those cute little bunnies strolling around on the deck. Now, just forget they're there, understand? Let me get this bandage off my foot. Oh, five days. And don't forget the six nights. You'll manage, all right. Won't be any fun, Owen. Yes, and neither would it be any fun to fill gas tanks in Hoboken. Not as much fun as living on the left bank with those Parisian beauties of yours. All right, all right, I know. And don't forget who's really doing the hard work, Junior. Including that plane trip tonight. Oh. For me, that's the worst part of it all. Uh, listen, how, how high do those bloody things fly? Oh, 30,000 feet, I think. Oh, it's preposterous. There, there, the bandage is off now. Now, let's get them on you. By the time the next tall ashore sounded, the transformation had been made. The bandages were on my brother's foot, and the crutches were lying snugly beside his bunk. And I was all set to leave. With Gerald's gray tweed coat belted around me, with Gerald's hat on my head, I strolled to the visitor's gangplank and left the SS Empress to its business. In a way, it was fortunate that I dreaded air travel so much. The thought of being carried aloft some 30,000 feet inside the monstrous machine parked at the Gate 7 on Orlick Field was completely engrossing. For this reason, I overcame any nervousness I might have had upon confronting the immigration authority. The official merely glanced at the photograph in my passport book, snapped it shut briskly, and handed it back. Mr. Gerald Robin Layton was on his way back home. I don't recall much about the flight. I remember about ten minutes of sheer terror when we took off on what seemed like a ridiculously short runway. I know there were several more hours of alternating fright, numbness, and drowsiness, helped by liberal amounts of alcohol. And then there was that agonizing half hour following the captain's announcement of our approach into Kennedy International Airport. And wonder of wonders, I was safe. The only one in danger was my wife. It was midnight in New York when I climbed into a taxi and gave the driver on destination Grand Central Station. In the terminal, I deposited my single piece of luggage in a public locker and took still another taxi to the street where Harriet and I had spent the last four years of our marriage. The brownstone was an imposing building from the exterior... But Harriet's money had made it possible to scoop out the interior and transform it into a duplex of cunningly modern design. I had spent several happy hours in this house. About seven or eight, I think. It was 1.20 in the morning by the time I arrived. And the traffic had gone from the quiet streets of Sutton Place. The street was empty. The shades of the buildings opposite had all been drawn against the night. I felt certain that no one saw me quietly insert the key into the lock of the front door. I went quietly upstairs to the bedroom. It was empty. But that was no surprise. It was Saturday night. Presumably, I was in Paris. Therefore, Harriet was on the town, probably in the company of her dance instructor friend. In a way, I was glad that she was running true to form. It helped me feel justified in taking the drastic course that I was about to take. About 20 minutes later, I heard the front door opening again. <laughs> oh, oh, my feet. My feet. You danced my little tootsies off tonight. You, you fled a stair here. You... <laughs> well, that's what you're paying me for, Mrs. Layton. <laughs> That's what you think, lover. Well, speaking of love... Oh, no, stop it. Now, Douglas, uh, no, stop it, you brute. Ah, uh, you mean I don't even get a kiss goodnight? Oh, tomorrow night, maybe. Right now, I just uh, want to go to sleep. I thought you looked a bit preoccupied tonight. Is anything wrong? No. 
unless you count a cable from my husband. Well, he's still in Paris, isn't he? He sailed on the Empress. He'll be here in another five days. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> isn't it? He can stay tomorrow, all right? I'll count the hours. Good night, my princess. Good night. And then Harriet started up the stairs. I picked up the pretty blue vase that adorned her dressing table and placed it behind my back. Hello, Harriet. Oh, oh and for heaven's sake, what are you doing here? You're, you're supposed to be in Paris. Well, I thought I'd surprise you, darling. And I seem to have done exactly that. <laughs> but your cable, you... You said you were taking the Empress. She won't arrive for days. Well, actually, I changed my mind about taking the ship. I flew instead. You? You were never inside a plane in your life. No, there's always a first time, isn't there? For everything. But why? You, when you're, you're so terrified of flying. Because I was in a hurry, darling. I simply couldn't wait to see you and do this. Don't! <laughs> shame about the vase, it cost a small fortune. The really distasteful part came now. As you may have gathered, I'm a man of fastidious taste. But when you have five days to lose, you can't afford the niceties. I knew it would be easier to lose myself in a region of the city where the lower depths are at their lowest. And so I discarded my British suit, my Italian loafers, and my continental manners. In an old pair of slacks and heavy wool shirt, I made my way to the Bowery. My first act was to join a shambling, silent line of vagrants outside the clothing relief agency. And I emerged with a costume superior to anything I could have invented. A moth-eaten sweater, a double-breasted jacket with a shredded lining, and a thousand unironable creases. And then I bought a bottle of Sauterne for 98 cents and rented a bed in a hotel called Miller's for 75 cents a night. And then, the next day, in a steam-filled diner where the coffee tasted like antiseptic, I picked up a mud-stained newspaper from the dirty tile floor. There on the second page was an item which gave me an appetite, even in that place. It said, Woman found murdered in East Side Brownstone. Ah, but the smaller headline beneath it was even more delicious. It read, dancing teacher held as suspect. <laughs> it wasn't something I planned or expected, but, well, why not? Why not? <laughs> Say, I, I think I'll have some more of that coffee. And then, the five days were over. It wasn't very far from the Miller Hotel to the docks. The first glimpse I had of the Empress' beautiful bow on the horizon thrilled me in a way I had never known before. But I couldn't stand about and admire it. I had things to do. I made my way as unobtrusively as possible back to Grand Central Terminal. I removed my luggage from the locker, and then in the washroom I shaved and changed into clean clothes. Then I went down to Pier 16 to greet the arriving Empress. I knew that Gerald would be among the last of the passengers to appear. But then, there he was, wearing my green plaid top coat with a collar pulled around his throat, wearing my Homburg hanging low over his eyes. He was using my crutches, too, and not very well. But with his foot so heavily bandaged, he still made a convincing cripple. Owen! Owen! Over here! Uh, you, know, you know, for a minute, I didn't think, didn't think you'd make it. Well, well, how was it? How did everything go? Oh, fine, fine. Look, when can I get rid of these crutches? They are killing Never mind the crutches. What about the steward, Mr. Pawkins? Did you see him before you left the ship? No, no, I managed to avoid him. I didn't even tip him either, just as you said. Good. Now get into that car. This isn't your car, is it? It's a rental car. Now get inside so we can switch clothes. A rental car? Well, weren't you taking the chance? I rented it in your name, Junior. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you really thought of everything. Owen, I have to give you credit. Well, just give me my clothes and that bandage. And fast. And so we made the switch as before. By the time I stepped out of the rented automobile, I was dressed in the Hamburg and the green plaid coat. And the bandages were back where they had originated. In fact,
fact, the crutches seemed like old friends as I hobbled back to the entrance of Pier 16. I spotted the ship's petty officer emerging from the passenger exit. Pardon me, sir. Uh, yes, sir. What can I do for you? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's rather embarrassing. You see, uh, there's a steward that I meant to take care of before I left my stateroom. He was very kind to me. What's his name? Uh, Porkins. He's an old fellow. Very nice. I hated to miss him when I left, but somehow I did in all the excitement. <laughs> Mr. Parkins was more than pleased when I handed him the two $50 bills. There were actually tears in his eyes. Oh, this is most generous of you, sir. Most generous. Well, you took very good care of me, Parkins. I know, I was a nuisance. Oh, no, sir, you were never. Why, I, I hardly even saw you, sir. Well, still, you brought me all my meals and so forth, didn't you? Hmm? Well, I, I was glad to do it, sir, glad to be of service. And I hope you'll be back on the Empress with us soon again. I intend to be, Parkins. Yes, you can be sure of that. As soon as I knew that Mr. Hawkins was remembered properly, and that he remembered me properly, I knew that everything was going to be just fine. I told my younger brother to drive his new car to the village, find himself a small apartment, and lay low. Then I took a taxi to my home. I knew there would be company waiting for me. Uh, Mr. Layton? Yes, I'm Owen Layton. Who are you? My name is Lieutenant Farley, Mr. Layton, New York Police Department. Police? What's the matter? My house been robbed or something? I'm uh, sorry we couldn't meet you at the ship. We knew you were coming back today, but we thought it would be easier to meet you here and uh, uh, break the news to you. What news? What are you talking about? Bad news, I'm afraid. Maybe we uh, we better go inside. Yes, come in. I knew exactly what the bad news was going to be. Now all I had to do was to keep from laughing out loud. We seem to have been witness to the perfect murder. Owen Layton can't be blamed for the murder of his wife and for the most natural reason in the world. Owen Layton wasn't in New York when his wife was murdered. Owen was on the high seas. Just ask Mr. Porkins or anyone else aboard the SS Empress. But before we congratulate Mr. Layton on his cleverness, why don't we wait until I return with Act Three? This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. Layton is a happy man today, despite the fact that he is all alone in the reconverted brownstone on Sutton Place. The smile never seems to leave his face, even as he hobbles towards the front door to answer the insistent chimes. His bandaged foot and crutches don't seem to bother him in the least. In fact, one has the impression that despite the tragic loss of his wife, Mr. Layton will never let anything bother him for the rest of his life. Uh, evening, Mr. Layton. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. I didn't know you were coming by tonight. Oh, it's all right, I hope. Yes, of course. Come in. Oh, thank you. You were a bit too broken up the other day when we had our talk about, well, about that terrible thing that happened to your wife. Well, I'm sure you don't blame me, Lieutenant. It was a great shock. Here, let me take your raincoat. Raining outside, is it? Yeah, a little. Uh, frankly, it was my decision not to send a radiogram to the ship. About your wife's death, I mean. It didn't seem right to break the news to you that way. Well, that was very considerate of you, Lieutenant. We knew you were aboard the Empress because of your cable. Yes. But you were right not to tell me when I was aboard. It, it, it would have been very uh, helpless feeling... Knowing that there was nothing I could do about it. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. At any rate, I suppose you've had some time to, uh, well, uh, think about what may have happened. <sighs> no, no, Lieutenant. The truth is, I still don't understand. That man who killed her, uh, or what was his name again? Douglas Denton. Oh, yes. It's not his real name. He called himself that at the dancing school, but he was born Bernard Eubank. I, uh... I take it you didn't know Mr. Denton. No, no, I never met the man before in my life. 
And why would he want to kill my poor Harry? Well, actually, he's still denying that he did. Well, how can he? From what I read in the newspaper, well, you seem to have caught him red-handed. Well, no, not quite that good. We knew that he'd been, uh, well, that uh, he and your wife had been seeing each other doing your visit abroad. And that they'd seen each other that Saturday night she was killed. In fact, he was seen in the vicinity of your house by several witnesses, not more than uh, ten minutes from the time when we estimated that she was uh, bludgeoned to death. I'm sorry, that's a little too graphic, I know. I, It's all right, Lieutenant. I want to know the details, I, I really do. Well, the one detail we don't know is why he would have done such a thing. I mean, frankly, we have Mr. Denton pegged as a rather small-time, you know, jiggle hole. I'm sorry to tell you that, too. Oh, it's all right. I'm sure Harriet wasn't to blame. I'm sure that that man just did whatever gigolos did and uh, made a fool of her. Well, did your wife do that sort of thing often? I don't know. I suppose she's made a few mistakes. Which of us hasn't? Well, now, if you could be more specific... You... No, Lieutenant. I'm sorry. I want Harriet's killer punished, Lieutenant Farley, but not at the expense of scandalizing my wife. I'm afraid that scandal won't be easy to avoid. We know she was having an affair with Mr. Denton. He's admitted that himself. But that don't give him any reason to break a vase over her head. Yes. Unless she had decided to end the affair, of course. Well, it's one possible theory, of course. Didn't you say you found my cable to her about coming home on the Empress? Yeah, that's right. Harriet didn't know I expected to return from Europe so soon. Perhaps when she informed her zig, her friend, Mr. Denton, he got angry. Yeah, that's possible, too. He might have just acted impulsively. Yes, Lieutenant. I'm sure it happened just that way. They quarreled. In your bedroom? Very well, in our bedroom, yes. They, they quarreled. And he picked up the vase and he struck her. But somehow... I can't believe it was cold-blooded or premeditated. No matter what the man is, Lieutenant, I hope the law isn't too harsh with him. I'll tell you what wasn't easy. It was the waiting. I had to wait for the outcome of two legal actions, the verdicts of both the criminal and the probate courts, but I had every confidence that human and fiscal justice would be done. And then, one night, a little more than two weeks after my return... Hello? Owen, it's Sheila. I... I beg your pardon? It's Sheila. God, I feel terrible not calling you before this, but I just found out what happened. I read the whole thing in the paper. A uh, back issue. Oh, oh, and you poor thing, you must be in the state. Are you sure you're calling the right number? Oh, of course I am. A at least that's the number in the telephone book. 815-5555. Well, you certainly have the right number, miss, but, uh, but I believe you have the wrong party. Oh, come on, stop it. You're the only Owen Layton in the directory. Well, that doesn't mean very much. Hey, what is this? Well, what are you trying to do? Well, I'm simply trying to find out who you are and... Why you think you know me? Wait a minute. Is there someone there with you? Is that what all the double talk's about? No, I'm alone. Well, then why the big act? Well, now listen, Owen. I told you not to try any of that shipboard romance stuff on me. I won't stand for it. D did you say shipboard romance? You heard me. I warned you that I wasn't interested in a friendly little kiss at the gangplank kind of stuff. Uh, uh listen... You're not talking about the... The ship, you mean, isn't the Empress. Of course it's the Empress. Cheryl, you idiot. Huh? Oh, what did you say? I said... Forgive me. I'm just so so mixed up about things right now. Well, you, you can't be so upset that you'd forget about me. Besides, from the way you talked about your wife, she didn't mean a thing to you. Look, Sheila... I can't talk anymore right now. You're not brushing me off that easily. Oh, and I warn you. No, I'm, I'm not trying to brush you off. It's just that uh, I'm having visitors, Sheila. Important people, business. All right. All right, tomorrow then. Early tomorrow. Uh, I'm not sure I can make it tomorrow either. Uh, I may have to go out of town. There are things to settle regarding my wife's estate. Well, there are things to settle, all right. Between us, 
Lover. Oh, God. Dear God, he's ruined everything. Everything. Pick it up. Pick up the phone, you miserable... Hello? Gerald, it's your brother. Oh, hi, Owen. How are you? <laughs> Never better. Never better. Oh, what's the matter? You don't sound well. Well, why shouldn't I be well? I should be feeling you on top of the world. I just had a lovely chat with a no-doubt charming young lady. What? Her name is Sheila. Isn't that a lovely name, Sheila? Uh-oh. Is that name familiar to you? Uh, oh, no, before you say anything else, oh, will, will you listen to me? Yes, that's why I'm calling, to listen to you. To see if there's anything you can say, anything at all, that will mitigate my intention of coming right over there and strangling you. Now, you've got to understand how it was, Owen. I was a prisoner in that stateroom, a virtual prisoner. Yes, and that was the idea. I told you never to leave that room. Never to so much as poke your ugly head out of the door. Well, it was easy enough for the first day, Gerald, but... After almost 24 hours of that, How I... many other women did you take up with? Oh, and she was the only one, absolutely the only one I had anything to do with. And if I know you, you had plenty to do with her. Well, I couldn't live like a hermit, for Pete's sakes. I can't believe what I'm hearing. I can't. You knew how important it was to convince everyone that you were me. But I did that, oh, and I told her I was you. Aye, that was clever. No, 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 she thinks I am you, oh, now look. The fact that she telephoned you tonight, doesn't that prove it? Oh, yes, that proves it completely. <laughs> Owen, Owen, I was really going crazy in that tiny room, so I took just one little stroll on deck one night. Yes, and met Sheila. I swear that I, I swear that I never knew she tried to get in touch with me. Your girlfriend, Sheila, is in New York right now. She's demanding to see me, you, me. What I mean is she's, she's read about Harriet's death. She knows that you... Uh, she knows that I... Well, she knows that Owen Layton is free and unencumbered and will soon be very, very rich. Oh, gee, I, I'm glad to hear that, Owen. I Shut up! I... Your friend Sheila isn't going to give up that easily. She's going to track me down. She's going to try to renew our little shipboard romance. And do you know what will happen when she does? What? Think about it, Gerald. She's going to take one look at me and I'll be cooked. Roasted, fried. She'll know I wasn't aboard the Empress. She'll know that she spent all that glorious week with another man. And how long do you suppose it'll take for her to put two and two together? Owen, Owen, couldn't you put her off? Now, now, couldn't you keep her from seeing you? How? Well, if you could leave town, if you could get away. You'd... Yes, it's the only thing that's occurred to me, too. If I left at once... You could always go back to Paris. You always said it's your favorite city. And guess what? I saw in the papers that the Empress is sailing again tomorrow for La Havre. For the first time in my life, I wasn't looking forward to a sea voyage. I knew that my idiotic younger brother had left me no other choice. The minute I was off the phone with him, I was on again, this time to my very obliging travel agent told me that passage aboard the Empress was indeed possible. But for the first time in my shipboard travels, I couldn't get a stateroom. Couldn't even do better than B-deck. But it was an indignity I was forced to accept. This time, my cabin steward wasn't an amiable gentleman like Mr. Pawkins, but a gruff, uncommunicative type who made no promises of devoted service. But then I wouldn't require much service. For one thing, I no longer needed my bandages and crutches. As far as the world was concerned, my troublesome gout was healed. Oh, uh, pardon me, sir. Yes? Aren't you the gentleman who sailed with us a couple of weeks ago? That uh, Porkins chap? Oh, oh yes, that's right. Uh, you were the officer who helped me find the steward. Yes, everything worked out all right there? Yes, everything went fine. Unfortunately, I couldn't get such good accommodations this trip. Well, that's a shame, sir. But then I don't think we'll have as easy a crossing of it this time. Why not? Oh, a bit of rough weather ahead, they say. Oh, fine. That's all I need. But rough weather ahead or not, at four that afternoon, the Empress pulled slowly away from the pier... And I admit that I breathed a heavy sigh of relief. And 
that evening. I was taking a nap before dinner when someone knocked on my door. Oh, who, who is it? Oh, it must be an unfriendly neighborhood steward. Yeah. Hello. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Oh, was there something you wanted, miss? Well, I, I've made a mistake. I, I thought this was Mr. Layton's cabin. Well, it is. I'm Mr. Layton. Oh, but you're not Mr. Owen Layton. That's the party I was looking for. But I am Owen Layton. <laughs> well, that's an interesting coincidence. I mean, it, 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 two people would have the same names and even look a little bit alike. Although, um, well, the Owen Layton, I mean, is quite a bit uh, younger. I don't know what in the world you're talking about. I, I saw your name on the passenger list, but the man I mean... Well, well, he's about your height, and he has a beard like yours, but he's... Well, he's not you. Well, and who are you? My name's Sheila. Sheila Ross. Uh, Sheila. I met Owen Layton two weeks ago, right on this ship. And now, now suddenly there's... There's another Owen Layton going the other way that... Oh, there's something very fishy going on here. Uh, you're mistaken, I swear you're mistaken. Listen, Mr. Whatever your name is... I don't know what this is all about. I, I don't know why there are two Owen Laytons going back and forth on this ship. Well, well, what's so strange about that? I, I mean, why are you going back and forth? Me? Because I have to. Because it's my job. You, I'm a social director. You mean you, you work on the Empress? That's right. And right now, I'm going to work on finding out what this is all about. <laughs> I stood rooted to the cabin floor, listening to the melancholy sound of the ship's whistle, warning the seas ahead that we were on our way, heading straight for troubled waters. As you have heard, Owen Layton's perfect murder had the customary imperfection. But at least he'll be able to enjoy one last ocean voyage before the authorities send him up the river. Isn't it nice to see justice triumph? Oh, beg your pardon, to hear justice triumph. You'll hear more out of me when I return shortly. you enjoyed tonight's voyage. We hope you'll be aboard next time the CBS Radio Mystery Theater takes you on a trip to all points mysterious. As you know, we have every means of transport available to us, from ships to trains to planes And isn't it wonderful to realize that we didn't use a drop of gas or oil? Our cast included Stotts Cotsworth, Earl Hammond, Bryna Rayburn, Dan Ocko, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. <laughs> quarter of a mile into Baron Frankenstein's woods, and it's pretty much Dullesville so far. <laughs> I was just thinking how strange it is. I haven't seen any animals around. Wait a minute. I think I just heard something. Probably a rabbit. I hope. Hey. There it goes again. Weird. Everything's so deathly still, and then suddenly just the faintest whisper of a sound, like... Like something dragging. Hey, who's there? Do you think you're frightening me? Okay. I'll go in after you. <sighs> the eyes. I can see them glowing. My God, it can't be. Oh, no. It's... It's... It... <laughs> Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated. Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. 
pleasant dreams.